want to welcome you to our worship service at Westside Baptist Church. Uh, I do have a couple of announcements I need to make. Uh, tonight is, uh, there's a football game on, I heard. And so we have a watch party that we will be hosting here. There will be chili provided. Uh, four o'clock is when it starts. You can come at four. Uh, what they would like, you, you don't have to come and be here right at 4 o'clock, but their goal is to have it all done and wrapped up downstairs uh, for the eating to be able to come upstairs for the game, which starts at 5.30. Is that thunder? <laughs> okay. Uh, so the watch party is at, starts at 4 o'clock for eating chili or however long it takes you to get here to get, eat, get it eaten. And then at 5.30 is the game time. We'll come up to the hall. Also, Super Bowl Sunday, if you have not uh, contributed to uh, the Super Bowl of Caring, there is, you can bring those donations. We have some up in front of the pew, or excuse me, in front of the sanctuary. <clears throat> And so if you haven't brought any and you would still like to, bring it in tonight when you come to the watch party. Uh, there are two uh, pots over here on the front pew. Uh, those are for the youth group who are collecting donations, not for themselves, but for the Super Bowl of Caring uh, to be given uh, to a local charity. And that announcement is in your bulletin also. So if you've got loose change on your way out, of the sanctuary, uh, drop a donation in that will go. This, these donations, and the donations we have of soup and crackers will go to doorstep. Um, I know that uh, you know we get excited about football, but uh, I, I saw this. I've seen this in the past, uh, but I saw this last night. And of course, I, I passed along the message to Pastor Ivan. Uh, you should be as excited about church as you are about the Super Bowl. So when your pastor makes a point this Sunday, we get to pour Gatorade on it. <laughs> well, that won't go very well. The council will be a little upset with us if we have the new carpet get Gatorade on it. So I think it's safe today. But uh, we need to keep things in perspective. So if you are, if you will, take those registration pads at the end of the pew and sign those. If you're visiting with us, we'd like enough information to stay in touch with you. There are a couple of other announcements. If Dawn, could you get Almira a microphone? Okay. Um, I think I caught all the families that have uh, children or youth that fall in the age range for our camping program this summer. If I did miss any of you, please see me after church and I can give you the information. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact Pat Carino or me or the pastor. Uh, we want to see that all our kids get to go to camp this year, so I'm asking for you, you parents to encourage them. Next Sunday we will start passing out uh, the, the scriptures uh, or whatever and the activities that they need to do to win points to win scholarship money. And they'll be able to, to earn up to half of their registration fee. Also, several people have shared with me that they would like to read scripture and worship. I can't remember everyone who told me that. That will get to my children's sermon in a little bit about forgetfulness. So if you are willing to read scripture during public worship, would you please let me know on the pew pad, let me know on the pew pad so that we can put you on a rotation of reading scripture in public. Chuck? Just wanted to remind the uh, Zoom on uh, the Beckham Center at 22nd, I believe it is. Uh, there'll be tickets in the office, and also they're asking for 75 sermons so they deserve the donation from each congregation. So, just remind everyone of that. Okay, you just did, so I don't have to yeah. say it. Uh, yep. If any, you have yeah. I would okay. like to remind everybody about tomorrow. Indian mission trip coming up in, in June. Now, if you are interested and have, have not signed up, the sheets on the bulletin board outside the office, please sign up so we can get a count of how many would like to go and so we can make those arrangements for the transportation of those. Okay. Also, this week is our first Tuesday, so we have men's and women's night out. The main thing I need to help. The, the 
men is that we're going to do it at 5.30 instead of uh, 6 o'clock because we're going to go to the same place the ladies are going. It's in the bulletin. Uh, so if you are planning on going there, just note that the time is 5.30. Even though if we got there at 6, we'd finish ours before they got there. <laughs> it's, it's true. We just <laughs> When we get a place of food put in front of us, we just eat it. We talk. So, anyway, alright, if there are no other announcements, why don't you get up and meet one another. If you don't know somebody, introduce yourself.
God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, as we have come to worship the Lord. In the book of Revelation, St. John saw a vision of thousands upon thousands of angels and saints, the great army of the martyrs and the prophets all around the throne of God singing. And that is the inspiration for our beginning song this morning. Would you please stand and join your tongue with the thousands of tongues in heaven as we worship God with song number 96.
coming to us from the book of Isaiah, a prophecy, which says, Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion, and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right, and what has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions, and seem eager for God to come near to them. Why have we fasted, they say, and have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves, and have not been noticed? Yet on the days of your fasting, says the Lord, you do as you please, and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife, and in striking each other with wicked fists. We, can, we cannot fast as you do today, and expect your voice to be heard on high, declares the Lord. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed, and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loosen the chains of injustice, and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and break every yoke that hinders us. It is it not to share your food with the hungry, and to provide for the poor wanderer with shelter, when you see the naked, to clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and He will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundation. You will be called repair of the broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Let us use the Psalter today, printed in your bulletin, as our reading for the blessing of the righteous. Those who live for the Lord find true happiness. Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in God's commandments. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious merciful and righteous. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Their hearts are steady. They will not be afraid. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have distributed freely. They have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their form exalted in honor. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Jesus Christ teaches us in His Sermon on the Mount about being the light and the salt of the world. The teaching we hear in Isaiah. Let us stand for the reading of this word. Our Savior said, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. 
Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, not an iota, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let us use the traditional response at the close of Scripture, the glory of Patri, as our response to God. Find somebody to go to church with. Praise the Lord. Welcome. 
other prayer requests or phrases. I know we are all excited about the Super Bowl. This is a day that we get to celebrate and see great victory. But I also want to remind you of something that happens on this day. More women are abused by their husbands on this day than any other day of the year. And so let us remember not only the victory and the excitement, but also that godly men do not hit their wives. Amen? Amen. Amen. And let us pray. If you are being abused or know someone of being abused, please have them come talk to me. Or Marianne Spano. Marianne Spano has a heart for women, women in abused, and women in trafficking. So please come talk to us if that is an issue in your household. Other prayer requests or praises. Then let us go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you. You are the great God of the universe. We come to delight in your love, to hear how, O oh Lord, if we will live with justice, you will bless not only the nations, but our home and our world. We humbly come before you, giving you praise, Lord, for you are worthy. You are worthy of prayer and adoration. You are worthy of old song and new. You are worthy, O oh Lord, of all that is said about you, that you are the one who created us. You are the one who blesses us and gives us everything that we need. And you are the one who sustains your church by your own strength, the strength you use to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. As we come before you, O oh Lord, looking at your glory, rejoicing in your presence, we must confess, O oh Lord, what we have done wrong. Lord, we have said and done things that are wrong. We have violated the trust that you have given to us. And Lord, we confess that we have not done what is right. Lord, in your graciousness and your mercy, please forgive us. Grant to us a renewed spirit and heart that we might follow you, O Lord, with the confidence that you forgive us and that you are good, that you keep your promise, that whoever confesses their sins to you, you will be just and that you will forgive them. Lord, overlook our sin and look upon us with gladness as, Lord, we rejoice in the work that you are doing in your church. We lift up to you, O Lord, the healing that you have granted us. We thank you, O Lord, for that miraculous power that can transform not only our physical, but our emotional and, Lord, our spiritual pain into goodness. That, Lord, you can bring out of all things righteousness, forgiveness, justice, and law. And so, Lord, we bring you our world, all of our concerns for family and friends who have cancer. Lord, grant them healing. Lord, we pray for people who need your touch of healing to get over this flu and pneumonia. And for those, O oh Lord, who are close to death, grant your servants a peaceful transition from this world into your kingdom as we wait, O oh Lord, for you to bring all the saints on that glorious day. God, we pray for our military for the men and women who are deployed, protecting us. And Lord, we pray for their families who are at home, grant them encouragement and strength, perseverance and love. And God, today we lift up to you all of your churches here in Kansas, who are searching for new pastors, O oh Lord, those who are open, O oh Lord, to the movement of your Holy Spirit, and for all the seminarians who are waiting, O oh Lord, for placement. Grant to them your quick move, O oh Lord, that your church might be filled with people to proclaim your gospel and to live out your love. Lord, thank you. Thank you for all that you give to us. Grant to us your spirit this day, for we ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our words of praise God accepts, God loves. He also likes our sacrifice of worship. And so as our ushers come forward, let us pray together for this offering that it might be light and salt in our world. Holy One, in Christ you have not given us the spirit of the world, but your Holy Spirit, that we may understand the gifts you have bestowed on us. Grant us now such understanding, that as you bless and direct our use of these gifts, we might
might delight in the glory of your grace at work in our midst. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Yeah. No, I'm 44, and I have to wear glasses, and I 
I have realized that I'm getting older because I am starting to experience what older people are experiencing. You know when you're getting old, your back starts hurting, right? Yeah. And then your knees start hurting. And your hands start hurting. And then you can start to lose things. You lose your car keys. You lose your billfold. You lose things all over the house. And then you start losing your eyesight. I prefer glasses. Then you lose your hearing. Then you start losing your memory. And then you just lose your mind. <laughs> Well, sometimes some people will lose their memory and have yet don't lose all of their money. And yet, you know, you can get old, but you don't have to grow up. Did you know that? Today, we are going to talk about being mature. Now, you don't have to have great hair to be mature. Some people have told me that I need to dye my hair. Right? I say, this is an old age, this is maturity. Right? Wisdom. That's right. And so today, we're going to talk about the difference between being old, which is just a a child who's gotten older, and being mature. What does it mean to be mature? To act appropriately. That's right. To be nice to one another. The Bible says when you're mature, you seek the unity of the church rather than dividing. That's maturity. Putting up with people who are different from you, that's maturity. And so I want to remind you, someday you're going to get older, and you might get old. But I want to encourage you to become mature, become wise, think about things, read your Bible, and do what God says, for you don't have to have gray hair to be mature. Amen? Amen. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our eyesight, for our hands, our hearing, our memories. Thank you for our minds and our bodies, and Lord, have mercy when they get old. Help us all to become mature, Lord, to grow up to act like adults, and to love one another. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may walk to Children's Church. Or back to your seat. Let us take out our Bibles and our glasses and read the Word of the Lord. Please listen to this reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And so was it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you. I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age, or of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden, and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit of who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in the words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept these things that come from the Spirit of God, but consider them foolishness, and cannot understand them, because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Holy Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to mere human judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? The 
But we have the mind of Christ. This is the reading of God's Word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We thank you that you have given to us the mind of Jesus Christ. That we might understand your Word and your way. Help us to put it into practice and become mature. We ask this in Jesus' name. Last week I talked about the word of the year being surreal. If I had to talk about the word for the church that is very popular right now, I would have to say the word is spirituality. Everything and everyone is talking about spirituality anymore. The word has become so popular, all you have to do is search Google or just search Amazon and it will come up with thousands of books that we could read. All of them from a different perspective, a different way of thinking. There's almost what historians call a third great awakening that is happening in our world. The first great awakening, as you know, was when the Spirit of God was poured out upon this country and upon England and Europe, and all of a sudden there was a revival. People wanted to know more about God. People were drawn back to God. And people came to the church and to other places to listen to what the Spirit of God was saying. The Second Great Awakening happened a couple years later when some New English patriots and pastors all of a sudden read the Scriptures, got the Holy Spirit, and were set on fire for preaching. And so what did they do? They got on horseback. They rode around and began to have tent meetings and preaching revivals, and all of a sudden people started coming to the Lord in droves. And today historians are saying we might be living in a Third Awakening. But all of a sudden, people are interested in spiritual things again. They want to know about God. They want their children to know about God and godly things. But one of the unique things about this spiritual awakening is this. Because we live in a multi-dynamic culture, because we are so capable of accessing almost any information we want from the internet, people are no longer looking at the traditional path of spirituality. People are not reading their Bibles. What are they doing? They're getting online. They're reading all kinds of things. So that the most popular religion that is growing really fast in the United States among our 13 and 14 and 15 year old daughters is what? Witchcraft. That's right. Witchcraft. Our daughters are practicing witchcraft which they are reading about and seeing on videos. And this is a great concern. Because in our culture, in our world, in United States, historians and also people who study society say things are changing. A recent Pew study showed that within the last 10 years, there has been a decline in what was known as evangelicalism in the main line. Five million Americans have stopped going to church in the mainline churches. That's, that's us. That's Baptists and Lutherans and Episcopalians and Methodists and Presbyterians and blah, 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 blah. There's a long list. And what has happened is, where have these people gone? Many of them have gone to churches that are singing contemporary songs and doing new things. I often call them the church of what's happening now. Whatever is popular and whatever is exciting, that's what they're doing. But most of them have done what? Stop going to church altogether. Ten million Americans who, ten years ago, were regularly reading their Bible and studying Scripture and being part of prayer groups and were in Sunday school, have all of a sudden quit. And many of them are now off searching for spiritual things, <coughs> spiritual enlightenment. And so that now the quickest growing part of us society is those who call themselves spiritual but not religious. That's right, I'm spiritual but I'm not religious. Which is quite the oxymoron. Because if you actually look at those two words, you cannot be spiritual without being religious. And why is that? Because spirituality is the practice of a religion. That's it. That's what spirituality is. It is piety. It is the day-to-day -day things that we do to grow in our faith and become mature. That's part of the struggle. People are so often today looking for entertainment and excitement they have forgotten the goal of spirituality is maturity. And for Christians, that means the goal of our spirituality is unity with God and Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. 
that at the end of our life, we should become so much like Jesus that someone would mistake us for the cross. Now, I know that's a big expectation, right? That any of us with gray hair would ever be ex experienced or thought of as Jesus. But that is the goal, that we would live out the commands of God. Because spirituality is simply those day-to-day -day practices. <coughs> Scripture reading, prayer, fasting. I know we don't talk about that on Super Bowl Sunday, getting up food. You know, <laughs> fasting. It's also doing charity and work, making sure that we also are encouragers. There's a long list of spiritual practices that we could do. And where does that list come from? Religion. Because religion is basically the thoughts, the testimonies, the teachings which we follow. There are world religions that have all kinds of different rules and regulations and teachings. But as Christians, we practice what Christ teaches. And that's really what makes Christian spirituality. But the struggle is this. Today, so many people are out there looking that they don't know what they're trying to find. And you can read all about that in my dissertation. You can buy it online if you want to. But that's for another day. What's the problem is this. Because we don't know what we're looking for, what are we going to find? Anything and everything. Including witchcraft, Hinduism, Buddhism. And today the exciting thing is people say, well, yeah, and so what do I get to do? I get to pick and choose what I want. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. A little bit of Buddhist teachings, right? A little bit of yoga. That all will help me become a spiritual person. So that spirituality no longer is what we do to honor God and become like God. It really becomes something that we do to make ourselves better. I do this spiritual practice to relieve stress. I do this spiritual practice because it makes me feel good. I do this spiritual practice because all my friends are doing it. And we know youth and adults are the same. We are driven by the herd, aren't we? If our friends are doing it, we want to do it too. And that's the struggle. The struggle is oftentimes spirituality and that whole concept that search for God all of a sudden becomes whatever we want. And that's what's wrong. Whenever you replace God as the center of your spiritual search, you are in jeopardy. Because spirituality is not about you. What is it about? It's about Jesus Christ. It's about finding this God who loves us and realizes He has already found us. It is about growing up and becoming mature. Now I know that's not popular, right? Because it's fun to be immature. It's fun to stir the pot. It's fun to be a rebel rouser. And all of us like to do that, right? But Paul would write in 1 Corinthians to the church, we must be careful because we are being watched. The world is watching us. Our children are watching us. Even our grandchildren are watching us. And I can tell you stories about times I have completely failed. When I, as a parent, thought, I'm going to teach my children what is right and wrong, and then all of a sudden I go off and I say something I shouldn't, and there's my three-year-old behind me repeating me. Oops. Shouldn't have done that, right? So we have to sit down, talk about confession, say I'm sorry, starting over. And that is part of the search today that I want to talk about. Paul is talking to the Corinthians about godliness. Corinth is full of world religions. There is an idol to every possible God. And Christians are right in the midst of that. And Paul is telling them to stay mature, to stay steady, to keep focused, not on eloquence and words, but on Christ. And so we hear Paul write, it was not with philosophy, it is not with wonderful stories, it is not with slideshows and popularity and entertainment that you heard this gospel. Rather, who did you hear it from? One who could hardly speak. We know from history that Paul had a stuttering problem. Paul was one who showed up in the Athenian area, arena, and when he began to speak, all the people who had been trained in rhetoric, how to properly do public speaking, began to mock him. Who wants to listen to a joker like you, they said. We want to listen to someone that words just drip off their tongue like honey, things that we want to hear. And Paul would be very clear. That's not what we're looking for. We're not looking for the best speaker. We're not here to be entertained by a pastor. What are we here for? To hear the gospel. 
to hear that mystery which was hidden long ago, which has now been revealed. And what is that? That God, who created you, loves you. And that He sent His Son to do what? To die for you. And so that you might be set free and be received the Holy Spirit and find God who is ready for you. That's the mystery. Not in elegant words, it's all right. It's not with great rhythm. Rather, it is weakness and fear and trembling that he began to preach. That we need to realize who we are searching for is the one who's searching for us. Abraham Heschel, who is a great rabbi, writes two wonderful books. One called God's Search for Man, and the other one, Man's Search for God. And in these two great volumes, he summarizes what is spirituality. The realization that the God who created us is not like Buddha, or not like Shiva, or any other gods who are heaven far away. It is the God who created the world so that He could come to us in human flesh and be with us. That is what God is doing. And what did He do for us? What Pascal says. He put a God-shaped hole in our hearts so that we would search for Him, and when we find Him, realize He's the only one who completes us, who fills us in, and helps us be who God wants us to be. And Paul would say that is the mystery that we talk about. All of spirituality is about Jesus Christ. It's about Him crucified, Him dying, Him lying in a grave, and what happened? Him rising from the dead. For how many other gods have done that? How many other spiritual leaders have given their life for their people to willingly lay down their life and die, and then three days later, get up again, come back to life, and promise us eternal life? That's what Paul would say. The search for spirituality is the realization that Jesus came to us, and when He comes to us and He finds us, what does He do? Does He leave us alone? No. He gives to us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who becomes our comforter, our counselor, our guide, our teacher, and the one who illuminates our minds to help understand the scriptures. And that's why my pastor always told me, I when you're reading scripture and you don't understand what it's saying, what do you do? You say, Holy Spirit, come help me. Or you're experiencing something that doesn't make any sense, what do you do? You say, Holy Spirit, come and help me. And what does the Holy Spirit do? It comes. Because God is good. Whenever we need Him, whenever we're searching for Him, we find Him. And that's what Paul says in this. Eight times he mentions the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who will help us to discern the will of God. It is the Holy Spirit who will open up our minds and free us. It is the Holy Spirit who will explain spiritual things to spiritual people who are searching for Him. It is the Holy Spirit that will actually search the depths of us as it searches the depths of God and shows us things that we need to have before. Always moving in the grace and love deeper and deeper into God. It is the Holy Spirit who does not judge us, but leads us to life. It gives us the mind of Christ. And what is that mind? The very mind of God. The God who comes to us wants to be with us forever. And that's what spirituality is all about. It's not about the right words. It's not about the right rituals. It's not about the right slideshow. It's not even right about the right singing of the right song. It's about encountering God. And when we encounter Him, realizing He is madly in love with us. That is why Paul quotes that Isaiah text. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. If you truly love Him, you will want to be drawn closer to Him. And being drawn closer to Him, He will show you how you can be transformed to be like Him. Because what is the goal of spirituality? Not to grow old, to grow mature, and to become more like Jesus Christ. And with the Holy Spirit, that is possible. All we have to do is ask Him, and He will be our help. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are out in the world looking for all laws. You have promised to draw close those who are near and those who are far away. 
And so today, Lord, we thank you that those who are searching for you will find you if they look for you in the Holy Spirit. Open our minds and the minds of those who cannot understand that we might truly see, O oh Lord, this incredible love that you have, that you were willing to die for our sins, that we might be free from Satan and to live with you forever. Guide us, O oh great Jehovah, we ask in Jesus' name. And that mystery which we talk about of the gospel is here at the table. That Christ was willing to die for us, to offer himself up for our forgiveness and salvation, and that through his blood we might become one people in the Holy Spirit in the covenant of love. My brothers, let us prepare our hearts and our minds as we come to the table of the Lord.
you do not need to be a member of this church partake. We simply ask that you hold the bread and hold the cup until everyone is served, and then we will feast together. My brothers and sisters, I pass on to you that which I received from the Lord, that on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he said, This is my body, broken for you. Take, eat, in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have produced the grain of the earth and the riches of your spirit, O Lord, that you have given us this bread, O Lord, to remember the sacrifice which you have made in and through your Son, Jesus Christ. As we eat this bread, come, Holy Spirit, come. Bring that memory back to life of that great sacrifice as an expression of your love, your devotion, and your willingness to forgive. For we ask this in Jesus' name. And Jesus took a cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Take each of you, drink in remembrance of me. For the apostles tell us as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, we come to be your light and salt of the earth. We come to bear witness to your forgiving love, the transforming power that you have in your Holy Spirit, and to be called to renew this covenant of love not only with you, with all the church and world. Lord, as we drink this cup, help us to remember that blood sacrifice which seals our salvation. We ask this in Jesus' name.
Jesus, as God has already said yes to us. And the Gospels tell us as soon as Jesus and his disciples were finished eating last supper, they sang a hymn. So would you join me in rising and we will sing, Let's Be the Tide of Vine. And if you feel comfortable, please join hands. There will be uh, youth who are at the doors with soup pots, so a couple of youth would come and get a soup pot to this door and that door. They are going to lighten your load by taking all the change out of your pockets and your purses today for the those who are in need. Let us see.